You know it's good for Trump because of how quickly the media moved on from the story. It is objectively an point. earthquake. A Kennedy himself yeah. is endorsing Donald Trump, but not just any Kennedy. The guy who was running as a third party candidate this cycle and was getting double digits when Joe Biden was still on the ballot. Yeah. He endorsed Trump on Friday and the crowd was enormous. Where does that leave you? It means that out of those few remaining votes that were in a third party line, you have a better than even odd shot, or at least a two to one in many of those states shot of retaining those voters for a Trump candidacy versus a Harris candidacy. That matters when we're talking about 10,000 votes, maybe 20,000 votes total over five or six different states. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. Just a catch of strays over here. <laughs> You're in for a hell of a show. Keep the faith. Hold the line and own the libs. It's time for our main event. Welcome back to the Ruthless Friday program. I am Josh Holmes, along with comfortably smug Michael Duncan, John Ashbrook, left to right across your radio dial, coming at you on a big Tuesday here in the world of politics. Lots happening. We're getting right to the quick at this point, aren't we, fellas? Yeah, I mean, it, the election is like right here. We're yeah. talking about just five, six weeks away. It's it's right here. Yeah. I mean, you blink and summer's over. <laughs> yeah, no. You know, kids are going back to school. It's almost Labor Day. It's just a lot going on. People are tuning in. Well, yeah. We got to get to it. I mean, I cannot wait for November. I really can't. Yeah, no, this is the kind of time where people like us get all amped up. It's like our Super Bowl for... 70 days. So if you're excited about that kind of thing, if you're even interested in that kind of thing, you got to come here to the Ruthless Variety program, like and subscribe, remember, on the top of your YouTube, get involved or get whatever you get your podcast, make sure you subscribe because we're going to bring the highest energy stuff to you all the way throughout all the latest breaking developments and everything, which started at the end of last week in fairness. Uh, it seems like every day has got something new, but we talked about last Thursday on the Vivek Ramaswamy uh uh, episode, what would the uh, what would the impact of an RFK endorsement be? Well, sure enough, along comes Friday, an RFK <laughs> Time for news. endorsement happens. They roll that thing out. Uh, here was one of the, I think, a personal highlight for the Variety program that we found particularly funny. Uh, let's go to clip one of uh, what we're talking about here. In America, 74% of Americans are now overweight or obese, and 50% of our children. 120 years ago, when somebody was obese, they were uh, they were sent to the circus. They were literally <laughs> there were police reports done about them. Obesity was almost unknown. <laughs> so look, <laughs> that shit's funny, right? <laughs> Send the yeah. fats to the circus. <laughs> <laughs> really, it really cuts against the grain of today's body positive culture. <laughs> you People know. like him because he says uh, what's on his mind. Yeah, that uh, that's clearly on his mind. He doesn't like the fat. Real blind spot for the fats. <laughs> but I mean, the thing is, the man's got a point. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, so like, I haven't researched the subject, but so so what happens at the circus? Is he implying that like you know? You come you hang out with the trapeze. You you get you get some exercise in, and then you're like you're in good shape afterwards. Or is it like you're now the sideshow? You know, no. Like, it's like you and the bearded lady, which no, actually yeah. has some parallels here too. So you just like sit in a, a little yeah, just look thing, you. and people pay a nickel, and they're like, "Oh, this is the fat guy." I think. <laughs> I guess it's a tough gig, but if it pays, it pays. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a time machine. But it seems like that's a good way to make a living if you find yourself in that situation. Like, so my job is I just sit in this hut. Like you got it, buddy. <laughs> so that was, that was one clip. Obviously, health, health care, uh, how you take care of yourself, big part of what he's been talking about throughout, and like your distrust of of institutions and things like that, which you could see. Look in the beginning of the spring. There was a double-digit third-party line on all of these ballots that went for Kennedy. And at the time, it was very much split because there was a ton of liberals that were entirely dissatisfied with Joe Biden. And then there were folks that were left there that were kind of like, I don't like any institution in America. I don't trust anything anybody has to say. Uh, not sure about Donald Trump because he's already been president and a part of the institution. This guy seems like he's outside the box. They found themselves 
in that. And so it was like a 10, 12% margin in a lot of these states, decisive. And that's why everybody was talking about RFK as such a major player in this election. Not that he was never going to win 270 electoral votes, but he was taking a substantial amount of the, of the electorate and however he was ultimately defined would have an impact on the outcome. Now, what happened when Joe Biden was replaced with Kamala Harris is that every left-leaning person that was in a part of that coalition summarily left. And you saw him go from 10, 12% to like 4% on his ballot. The remaining few are a part of that. We're about to talk about a mm -hmm. Fabrizio memo that came out from the Trump campaign that we're going to put a little bit of lead on the target as to why that endorsement matters more than you think it does. We're going to talk about how it could help, how it couldn't help. We'll talk about the long list of Harris failures uh, and how that now extends to astronauts. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, literally everything she touches just goes to shit. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know how she's trying to reinvent herself. And, you know, like Tom Cotton had a nice little weekend oh, vignette terrific. on that that we'll give you a little bit. And then Finland's up to no good. We'll talk a little bit about what's happening there and how they conduct diplomacy. New, new way. Yeah. Very new direction. Which I think you're going to be interested in if uh, you're a listener. Here. As my wife would say, she's from Texas. It involves being naked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It does involve being naked, no question about it. So we're going to get to all of that right after this. Americans love using their credit cards, the most secure and hassle-free way to pay. But D.C. politicians want to change that with the Durbin Marshall Credit Card Bill. This bill lets corporate megastores pick how your credit card is processed, allowing them to use untested payment networks that jeopardize your data security and rewards. Corporate megastores will make more money, and you pay the price. Tell Congress to guard your card, because Americans lose when politicians choose. Learn more at GuardYourCard.com. All right, so Tony Fabrizio is a pollster on the Trump campaign. He's been a longtime pollster of the Trump campaign, been a part of that orbit. We've known him in a lot of different varieties even before that. Very trusted pollster. Guy knows what he's talking about. So right. he breaks out some numbers to tell you how the RFK endorsement may be impactful here. You ought to listen to it. This graphic, if you're watching this, you're probably going to be like, what the hell is all that mean? Well, we're here to explain it to exactly. you. Exactly. Right? We're here to explain it to you. So what you're looking at at the top is the last rung of poll numbers that RFK got prior to his exit of the race. You can see 5%, 3%, 4%, 3%, 4%, 4%, 4%. Yeah, that so was once 5% in Arizona, 3% Georgia, 4% Michigan, 3% North Carolina, 4% Nevada, 4% Pennsylvania, 4% Wisconsin. Yeah, all of those were like double digits three months ago. Mm -hmm. And now they're down to what they were. So what he did helpfully is break out, okay, of those remaining votes that are in all of those states, what does the ballot question look like for them? If they were forced to choose mm -hmm. between Trump or Harris, where do they go? What do you, they found consistently across the board were leads by Donald Trump amongst those remaining voters. Mm -hmm. The big ones, I mean, you're looking at 5328 in Arizona, right? 4734 in Georgia. Michigan's a little tighter, 4341. They're persists some Democratic upheaval there, largely because of the Hamas caucus. Uh, North Carolina, 58-22. Nevada, 66-16. Wow. Huge. Huge in massive, Nevada. massive number there. And you can see the out, the Western stuff it has its own character. There's a reason for all mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. PA, 49-35. Wisconsin, 55-25. So where does that leave you? It means that out of those few remaining votes that were in a third party line, you have a better than even odd shot, or at least a two to one in many of those states shot of retaining those voters for a Trump candidacy versus a Harris candidacy. That matters when we're talking about 10,000 votes, maybe 20,000 votes total over five or six different states separating the margin of victory here, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's confusing in that graphic because they're totaling the percentage that they're going to net on RFK's current ballot position. But to put it in real terms in a head-to-head, -head, okay, so in Arizona, he had 5%, and they're netting 25% of the RFK vote. Yeah. Well, that's 1.25%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in a state that was decided by, what, 
couple ten thousand ten thousand votes. Yeah, like less than a percent. That's a huge, huge deal. Huge deal. And you know it's good for Trump because of how quickly the media moved on from the story. It is objectively an point. earthquake. A Kennedy himself yeah. is endorsing Donald Trump, but not just any Kennedy. The guy who was running as a third-party candidate this cycle and was getting double digits when Joe Biden was still on the ballot. Yeah. He endorsed Trump on Friday, and the crowd was enormous. And the, all of the theatrics were incredible. I know you guys saw the video of him walking up on stage, everybody going nuts. It was it was an electric political experience, and the media tried to turn the page as quickly as they possibly could mm. this weekend. I think that's as good of an indicator as any yeah. that it doesn't help Democrats; it helps Republicans. Let me give you a little sense of the of the uh, corporate media write up. Does RFK matter? Ponders Axios. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. joined former President Trump at a rally in Arizona on Friday, hours after the independent candidate suspended his campaign and backed the GOP presidential nominee. The impact of Kennedy's endorsement is likely to be small, but even a marginal boost for the former president in the margins of a few key battlegrounds could tilt a razor-thin election. Quote, in my heart, I no longer believe I have a realistic path to electoral victory, Kennedy said on Friday. That much is very, very true. Trump thanked Kennedy uh, for the very nice endorsement, quote unquote, saying he's a great guy, respected by everybody. Trump echoed earlier sentiment in his campaign rally. Bobby and I will fight together to defeat the corrupt political establishment. That is clearly a through, through yes. line yes. between the two campaigns that has left a few of those voters that are now attainable, correct? Yeah, yeah I mean, look at COVID, right? I mean, perfect example. RFK wouldn't be in the presidential conversation if it wasn't for COVID and the way our governments lied to us. Um, and, you know, his ex the whole thing we played at the top, which is fun. <laughs> it's funny. But he does have this following in a health-conscious, anti-industrial food in our diet sort of, you know, like yep. there's yoga moms and people who drink green juice every morning who like what RFK has to say about that stuff. They're distrustful of institutions. They're distrust distrustful of everything. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Donald Trump has to capture that sort of libertarianish streak in that coalition that RFK captured. No question about it. There's an awful lot there, you know, particularly, look, if you look back in the last six weeks and nothing but a honeymoon for Kamala Harris, and you imagine the high water mark of all of that is probably the DNC, you're coming out of that now. There's polling that would suggest, as of yesterday, that things have settled back in, and it looks a lot like what we were talking about a year ago of what a presidential election would look like. You know, obviously a lot of water under the bridge with the revelation that Joe Biden was absolutely unfit for office, a disastrous debate performance, an attempted assassination, and then a switch at the top of the ticket for Democrats. All of that aside, now we're back to what looks like a nip and tuck race for 270. I mean, this uh, when you were talking about the through streak between both campaigns, I couldn't help but think, like, the conversation we just had with Vivek of how he was talking about this, like, blob of an administrative state. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that a lot of Americans realize that, like, why are these, like, petty tyrant administrators, unelected officials making so many critical decisions for me? And like Duncan said, during COVID, <laughs> they're allowed to run amok. And now on a daily basis, they're allowed to run amok. And a lot of Americans are fed up with that. No question. Well, the other thing is from just a pure brass tax political sense, Democrats are a little bit more leery than you, they lead you to believe. Mm. And there's only a few sources that you can go to on that. Uh, one of the most, I would say, famous of them is James Carville, who says in New York Post, uh, Trump's poll numbers are lulling Dems into a false sense of security. Legendary Democratic strategist James Carville cautioned Democrats against falling into a sense of security as polls show Kamala Harris leading the race against former President Donald Trump echoing many of the private concerns of Harris's allies who feel the polls are a bit more rosy than reality, Carville stressed in real time with Bill Maher that uh, she will have to work a lot harder to win the Electoral College. And this is his point. I challenge Democrats with some eye of caution here. First of all, most want to say we have to win uh, by three in the popular vote to win the Electoral College. So when you see that poll that shows us up two, well, actually, you're down one, if the poll is correct, Carville says. 
The other thing is Trump traditionally, when he's on the ballot, chronically under polls. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he's making two different arguments, both of which are willing to, I mean, they're, they're important to discuss. Democrats have always thought because of the existence of California and New York and these big population centers that always vote liberal and their electoral votes are never up for grabs, that they bank a whole lot of national vote. That's why they wanted to get rid of the electoral college. Right. Right. Because these huge population centers that are predominantly Democrat, they bank a lot of vote. And so they are 3% above, I mean, in total, where you know, you would likely need to be from a pure election standpoint on a national poll. No question about that. But I think the second point is actually here the most important, which is he under polls, Mm -hmm. always has. And if you look at where the margins were in both 2020 and 2016 as to where he was vis-a-vis Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden in the month of September, Democrats would look at that and be like, well, we feel really good about that. Ultimately, that's not what turnout looked like. You brought a whole bunch of people and a larger universe of, of voters than were on the radar of most pollsters. I think that's a real phenomenon, don't you, fellas? Yeah, I mean, if you look back at the 2020 polls, like you were saying, in September, you know, he was down outside the margin of error. Trump was down yeah. 5 points, 6 points, 7 points, 8 points in some of these national polls against Biden. But, I mean, it's been true since 2016 that Trump voters will crawl over broken glass to get to the polls for Donald Trump. So, yeah, I mean, you see those polls that, you know, Biden was leading by nine. And what did it turn out to be? Like 40,000 votes over five states or something like that. Tight as a tick. Yeah. Right. So, like, if you think about it globally, he's in better position right now, just mathematically, than he was in 2020 or 2016. It's true. And I, I also just think, look. The voting universe of Donald Trump is very unique, Mm -hmm. and you're dealing with a lot of infrequent voters. Mm -hmm. And the political system has been designed to formulate an opinion both on polling and just who you target and get out the vote efforts to deal with your most likely voter, right? People who vote in midterms, they vote in general elections. You know, when you get the next rung down, it's people who's maybe voted in a primary or two, they skip an election. What we saw in both 2016 and 2020 is you had a whole bunch of people who just don't vote very often, Mm -hmm. but they're coming for Donald, which is makes up that margin of where pollsters see a universe. Now, maybe that's different now that the third time he's on a ballot, people have a little bit better idea of what that universe ultimately looks like, but it's thought provoking. I mean, also, you know, I think there was this interesting phenomenon. I mean, I personally felt it. Um, in the almost immediate aftermath of the attempted assassination of Donald Trump, I kind of thought like, okay, now maybe, this is such foolish thinking at the time, now maybe the media and like Democrats will stop demonizing Donald Trump and his supporters to such an extent. Like I, I remember seeing tweets. You sound stuff. like me. Yeah, I remember seeing tweets <laughs> yeah. from people who were like, you know, I feel like I can now wear my MAGA hat outside and not have someone call me a fascist and try to punch me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because there's this, horrible kind of sentiment in the democrat party where i mean uh what's her name that congresswoman who was like if you see a trump supporter out there maxine, you make sure, waters. maxine waters oh yeah, yeah. get in their She's face like, get in their faces make sure they feel like they're not welcome you know like this extreme hostility that the media has helped cultivate that democrats have helped cultivate and then like within 48 hours mm-hmm. you, no one's talking about the assassination the media is like oh no on to the next subject you know, we're not going to talk about <laughs> you're exactly right i mean think about the thematics at the dem convention they were talking about trump is dangerous yeah. trump is a is a threat to democracy yep. they were right back right back at the rhetoric that got this guy what he was doing and the assassination attempt exactly it's just it is sort of bonkers but i think we i mean Look, the media is capable of anything, but what we've seen over the last six weeks is hilarious. It's unreal. It's hilarious, including the one and only time that she has come out and said anything about policy whatsoever was this price gouging Mm -hmm. (laughs) nonsense. One time. She literally at one time with words out of her mouth said, here's what I would like to do with the economy. Well, now that we're past the DNC convention, Politico. Hill Dems try to tamp down backlash to Harris's grocery price gouging pitch. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we saved it for three weeks, right? Oh, we had to keep the lid on the thing. We can't ditch her in our own convention. But now that we're talking some details, 
Under pressure to defend Kamala Harris's grocery price gouging plan, some Democratic lawmakers are delivering a quiet message to anxious allies. Don't worry about the details. Yeah. Oh, that sounds pretty so familiar. I... It's never going to pass Congress. That's their message. It's 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 so funny. Um, <laughs> there, <laughs> don't worry about the candidate. You know, <laughs> don't worry about the candidate who's running for president, who we all support, and we were just in Chicago cheering for. We don't actually, you know, think we're going to pass that. None of us buy that. And and, and I love the self preservation and all of this and the cowardice. It's like they waited. <laughs> they waited until. Like August is now yeah. ending, and they got to come back to DC and answer questions from reporters. Oh yeah, because Congress is gonna come back, and then they're gonna be chased through the halls and be like, "So, uh, price controls that worked really well in South America." Don't worry about all of yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, that's what they're doing. It's yeah. completely hilarious. So the Harris campaign proposal unveiled as a part of a first big economic policy speech has become a focal point of her presidential rival, Donald Trump, and fellow Republicans who claim that she's pushing communist price controls, which it is. Uh, it is also which it is <laughs> alarmed fact food check, yes. industry officials, and that's my favorite part. It's alarmed food industry officials and even some left of center economists who've warned such policies can hurt more than they can help. I love that the food, like all you're doing is taking trying to pilot the American electorate through this extraordinarily horrible time of COVID, where basically these same idiots shut down your livelihood, but you've got to produce food because, I don't know, Americans need to live. They need to eat. So you figured out how to do that, all of that, with a 1%, what did you say, 1.2% margin? Yeah. By grocery stores, 1.2% right. margin. And then they come out the back end, people are like, man, everything's expensive. And they're like, yeah, it's those guys. <laughs> right. Like, right. Well, if you're a grocer, you got to be like, get the f you got to be kidding me. Yeah. Right, it's, it's not the government. It's not us who have been, like, printing money and spending it on, like, Student loan forgiveness to juice turnout in this election, getting money that was, uh, you know, uh, taken from hardworking Americans who paid their own way and giving it to a group who we think is underrepresented in our polling. Yeah, that can't be the problem. It's got to be the grocery store. <laughs> well, that's where libs think food comes from. Yeah. Just comes from the store. Chicken just it just shows up at the yeah, store. Yeah, it's just magically. from the chicken maker. <laughs> it's just because the chicken just, maker just right press here. Press the DoorDash button. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's it. And that's this how we fix the, it. This is the nut. The quote. The the at the end of this. It's clear to me these are very general, lofty goals," said one of the Democratic <laughs> lawmakers, who was granted anonymity to oh, discuss yeah. the yeah, public. I wasn't say that on Profile the record. Profile hero. Very Profile general, <laughs> lofty goal. I'd like to know who said that this is a lofty goal. <laughs> Communism lofty. is something they're shooting for. Yeah, it's like no, it'd be great if we could control the grocery stores, but you know, it's lofty. Right. What do you expect? <laughs> it was Bernie Sanders. He was like, "Listen, it's a bit too far for me. I can't <laughs> that name of this show. Yeah, I can't do that. Maybe the billionaire." who speaks after me might have some thoughts on this. Uh, so, but listen, it's not just that. Like what she has done to try to hide her record mm -hmm. over the last six weeks has been nothing short of magnificent. And she's had a compliant press oh, yeah. in many regards. Can we pop up graphic too? This is the New York Times op-ed page. Kamala Harris begins to sketch a new economic vision a new economic vision, a new economic vision. She's vice president over the last four years. She's cast the deciding votes on the most explicitly Biden economic pieces yeah. of this entire agenda. Like she, there is no new to the, the only thing that's new is that perhaps she'll go a little bit further and punish the grocery stores <laughs> for their problems. <laughs> I mean, that's right? a, it, I, I saw this thing, it was, um, Oh, gosh, it was one of Ashbrook's friends who tweeted this, who was like, uh, the most damning thing that Kamala Harris has pulled off is make Donald Trump the incumbent and make people forget that she's actually been in office. It's like, I wonder whose job it is to inform the public about such no, things. No, I mean, that's yeah. the funniest thing. It was Sam thing. Stein. That's what it is. Your buddy, Sam Stein. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the funniest thing that they're all like, whoa. Yeah. This is an interesting technique yeah, yeah. that she's using. What she's trying to do is to convince everybody that she's new and different and that she wasn't vice president. We'll see if it works. So like, isn't it amazing how we're all dumbasses not doing our job? <laughs> yeah, it's I, like, uh, I thought that was your job, you clowns. <laughs> can I ask Spaghetti to put that graphic up one more time? Because I'd like to call attention to the subheader here where uh, the columnist goes on to say that she's telling a new story, quote, about how the economy works. Oh. <laughs> 
Kamala Harris is telling us how the economy works. About yeah. it. How because all of her vast experience with economic <laughs> Uh, cannot be defined by the four years that she spent as vice president, uh, more likely in the, the time she spent as attorney general running against only Democrats uh, in, and laboring over how to let people out of jails. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's more. Dude, she could write her entire economic plan, plan in crayon, and <laughs> Sam Stein and these journalists would hold it up and be like, wow, goodwill hunting. He's <laughs> among us. You know what I mean? It's just like, they're like, wow, she's made Donald Trump the incumbent. I've been duped and I'm letting it happen to me because I have no self-respect. If it, you want to see what we're talking about in Technicolor, perfectly demonstrated before the American public, I give you Tom Cotton on ABC Sunday show yes. with John Carl. Can we play clip number two, please, Spaghetti? And, and President Trump is going to draw a sharp contrast with Kamala Harris who has supported things like decriminalizing illegal immigration or giving taxpayer-funded health insurance to illegal aliens or taking away health insurance on the job for 170 million Americans, banning gas cars, confiscating firearms. Wait, These are all wait, what do you mean taking away health insurance? What are you talking about? She said when she ran for president that she wants to eliminate private health insurance on the job well, 170 well, million Americans, John. Yeah, I mean, I mean that, that is not her position now. She knows How do you know that's not her position? Medic- How do you know that's not her position? I mean, she, she says she no longer she supports uh, she Medicare said that. for All. She has not said that. Okay. Maybe anonymous aides on a Friday night have said that, but the re- but the last thing that she said. But on this was not a stops. radical uh, no. a convention. I mean, she she, <laughs> she looking to change the subject. Wow. Bernie Sanders. Uh, she is not taking the positions of the far left of her party. She's clearly making an effort to move to the middle. I, I, I did hear what you said to Senator Sanders, and yeah. I, I thought it was clear that he's very disappointed that she's taking these efforts not to change her positions, but to hide her positions, John. The American people are totally justified to conclude that Kamala Harris is a dangerous San Francisco liberal based on what she campaigned on the last time she ran for president and what this administration has done for the last four years. What a tip go. of the old yeah. cap to yeah. Mr. Tom Cotton once again. Full clinic from Tom Cotton. I mean, the first guest of the Variety program delivering once again. What I loved about it in particular was when he really put John Carl's face in it <laughs> when he's like, yeah, maybe an anonymous aide on a Friday night said that she doesn't support that anymore. But implicit in that is why the fuck aren't you doing your job? Yeah. yeah. You know, why, why can't you get who might be the next president of the United States on the record? Maybe with they should weather? answer these questions. Yeah. I love it so much. I because love it. He called out in an instant the like John Carl trying to be a little lapdog for the Dems and saying, she, she's changed her position on that yeah. with zero evidence of this. And well, zero evidence of this. But he has, he has all the talkers. And so all he can do is desperately try to change the subject. This wasn't a radical convention. Yeah, and it's like, well, I thought we were talking about the policies that she didn't disabuse. It's like, you know, it, I mean, just for you, the listener, I mean, what, she, what, he's, what Tom Cotton is talking about very specifically when they're talking about he was being challenged on the issue of doing away with private health insurance or all the various things that they lined up. She as a candidate and as a sitting vice president, has never discussed any of this. The last time that she's spoke anything, she's given very definitive views Mm -hmm. about where she sees decriminalizing the border, whether she sees uh, getting rid of private health insurance, uh, more taxes, all those things. She said that all directly without conflict to the camera. Now, over the preceding six weeks, what we've seen is aides to the campaign. Yeah. Aides to the campaign saying that, uh, well, she doesn't. She doesn't believe him. I mean, it's beautiful. He just instantly, Tom Cotton instantly destroys him because when he's like, as a reflex to serve the Democrat Party, he's like, she's changed her position based on zero fact. And Tom Cotton says, she has not. She's like, show me the evidence. Your job has been to try to talk (laughs) to the candidate. And then the whole point becomes their dereliction of duty as journalists to go out and try to get her to talk. Their uh, agreement to be so subservient that they're like, no, don't talk to her because we know she's an idiot. And if she says something, it's going to end her campaign. Just that's a clinic by Tom Cotton. Yeah. That's how it's done. Now, let me just tell you why, like from a functional standpoint, from an operative side of why this is important. She's not being the one who's going out and saying, I don't believe in those things. Mm-hmm. Because Dems have, and this is the same crew that did it, they have the same deep-seating fear of the John Kerry wind sale mm-hmm. going back and forth, 
right? When George W. Bush prosecuted the case against John Kerry in 2004 for adopting new positions over long-held positions, and they artfully put it to a, a, a wind sail. Yeah. Right? Where he's going back and forth across the lake on each side, and they were highlighting what it was that they had believed and now believe. And it just it perfectly showed a politician unmoored. Yeah. Who would say anything to get elected. Plus, he looked like an effete liberal. Which, which he was. was. You know, true. Which he was. But that is what they're, that's why her voice isn't out there. They don't want that ad. Their hope is that John Carl and the rest of them will carry that water for them. So when ads come up saying, this is what she said, this is her own words, like, look at what she's saying, they're like, well, that's fact check <laughs> false. <laughs> because on a Friday night from a background aid, I was assured fully that she does not believe in any of that. Well, she said she would do an interview by the end of this month. Yeah, and well, the just clock six, is ticking. 60 minutes is waiting. Yeah. I got bits already filmed. 60 minutes is waiting. You know, you're going to get Scott Pelley in there. They'll film two hours of stuff and cut it down so it looks like an infomercial for, yep. like, ShamWow. Exactly. You know? It'll, it's just, it's disgusting. Well, anyway, that's our question of the day. Because uh, this one, I think we're really going to get some good answers. We get good answers from everybody on, on all of these questions. But this one, I really do want to know. Do you think that undeciders are going to buy any of this? Like, do you think Kamala's rebrand in I don't believe anything I've said to a camera out loud or any of the things I have voted for or any of the things I did as vice president are like somehow not the things I would do as president? Does anybody buy that? And, and that's the thing. It's critical because when we're talking specifically, do you think undecided voters will buy the Kamala rebranding? The nature of being an undecided voter is these aren't people who are as plugged into politics as us, as informed as our listeners. So these people may not know how much Kamala is flip-flopping. So it's dangerous. And I want to know from our audience who's super plugged into their communities across the entire country, across the entire world, do you think this rebranding works? For undecided voters. Yeah, we're going to do all that. We'll read them to you on Thursday. And when we come back after these messages, we're going to play a very apropos bunch of discussion that we gave to you last week about whether the RFK endorsement potential at that point would make any different. And we'll, we'll read all those back to you. So we'll get to that right after this. Folks, let me tell you about my friends at Americans for Prosperity, America's largest grassroots organization. Americans for Prosperity is out there every day fighting for you. Their goal? Reignite the American dream. AFP's priorities are simple. Secure the border, end inflation, make energy more affordable. And AFP gets results the old-fashioned way through grassroots activism. They bring together like-minded conservatives, turning them into a grassroots army and defeating the left's terrible big government agenda in the states and in Washington. And that's where you come in. With the media, celebrities, and universities stacked against us, it's the grassroots that will help us win. So please find an Americans for Prosperity chapter in your state and get in the fight. Go to americansforprosperity.org. Okay, so our question of the week uh, last Thursday in what was a very well-attended affair with Vivek Ramaswamy. Uh, thank you to all of you who tuned in to that. That was an awesome discussion. Got a ton of feedback. Uh, and it's nothing like half a million people just giving you your thoughts on stuff to make you clarified about what's going on. We asked whether RFK potential endorsement would make any difference in this campaign, and you had answers. So we'll start out with a voice. And remember, if you want to submit your answer and have it read, like and subscribe, like and subscribe if you wish to opine. That's you, right. You coined that, right? Isn't that? Yeah. Isn't that right here on the Ruthless Variety <laughs> Program. <laughs> That's right. That's right. The first one comes from Mike Sharp. Mike writes, RFK dropping out, endorsing Trump. And doing the rally in Glendale, Arizona, was absolutely perfect. Arizona has lots of libertarian, anti-pharma types that were probably RFK supporters or at least RFK curious. The coordination on that was excellent. I think it'll be a boost. Yeah, well, thank you, Mike. I think you're alongside of a whole lot of people on that. Uh, Dunks, what else we got? This is from David Titzer. Could RFK help Trump? I see RFK as being as much as a Democrat as a libertarian. I think there's a lot of libertarianism on the right. So, yes, it could help, especially if they hammer on this point. Democrats betrayed 
RFK, the country, and you. Mm. The modern Democrat Party is so anti-libertarian, it shouldn't be a question anymore. And I think this question gets to a larger thematic of Trump's campaign. I think it's you know secondary or tertiary to the overall message in defining Kamala Harris. But the party of democracy is pretty undemocratic. They spent millions of dollars yeah. to take RFK off ballots mm -hmm. in swing states. We had a what a a <laughs> primary for about thirty seconds after Joe Biden dropped out, and they anointed her yeah. as the Didn't candidate. Didn't a vote. I mean, it's kind of fucked up, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great point. They are the opposite of the democracy party. Right. They're pushing this, like Vivek was talking about, they're pushing this administrative state that's wholly unaccountable to anybody, and they just take away your gas stoves, they take away your air conditioning, and they do everything without any voters' input. And I just, like... They just say, oh, you know, we, we just want everyone to vote. Everybody's voice matters. <laughs> Right. Yeah, but not if they're going to pull the lever for RFK. Totally. <laughs> exactly. Characteristic, smart advice out of Dave. What I'd like to know out of him is is how his name worked in high school. You think that was a tough one? I think he was a hero. You think so? Because you can play it both ways. Yeah, if you just embrace it and lean in, yeah. then you're a cool guy. And then you could be very, very cool. Yeah. Well, hats off to you, Mr. Titzer. We'll, we'll head on to... Uh, <laughs> Dave was cool. Dave, at least he's that, smart. Man. I know that. I know that. <laughs> Uh, but I agree. I think he was probably pretty cool oh, yeah. in the process. All right, Smug, what else do we got? This is from Don Finley, and he writes, If the RFK endorsement is not bad for the Dems, there'd be no wailing and gnashing of teeth, which is delightful. He and Trump also commandeered the news cycle before the DNC stage was torn down. How does Bobby running the CDC or HHS sound? I might need to start watching C-SPAN once. That would get rolling. I mean, <laughs> that. so I think he's onto something. When you have the Democrats... Their instant reaction yeah. was such rage. Someone, I can't remember who had this tweet where they said that, like, cults don't flip out when you join. They flip out when you leave. Mm. And he was like, that's why the Ooh, devs are freaking out about RFK. That's good. Great line, right? That's mm -hmm. really good. Yeah, no, I think that's probably right. So you want, want to know what else this lady has screwed things up? <laughs> Let's hear it. I can't wait. <laughs> so she's the space council chair? Got a lot of jobs when you're vice president, <laughs> none of which she does particularly well. <laughs> she's spread a little thin. Uh, spread a little it's, thin. Uh, after all, it's Brat Summer. You know, she's busy. Yeah, so yeah, so she's she's the head of this National Space Council. AP reports that NASA decides to keep two astronauts in space until February. Nix's return on troubled Boeing capsule. Who would have guessed that would have been a bad idea? <laughs> So this is the story. NASA decided Saturday it's too risky to bring two astronauts back to Earth in Boeing's troubled new capsule. They'll have to wait until next year for a ride home with SpaceX. <laughs> what should have been a week-long test flight for the pair? A oh, week, week long, Are you dude. kidding me? And now it's going to be a better part of a year. Oh, Kam week? Kamala told them she was going to send them up for a week. Well, and now they're technically stuck she was in Space Czar. They never referred to her. Uh, as that, no, no, Czar, she was just examining, this. <laughs> examining the root causes of space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what in the good. world? This is hilarious. These people, can you imagine? Like, hey, can you send word back? Um, you know, that dinner party I'm supposed to have next Friday. Not gonna make it. <laughs> Sounds like Super Bowl at best. Imagine being those astronauts, and then Space Czar Kamala. Gets on the video screen. She's like, listen, I want you guys to get on this Boeing capsule, and I'll bring you home. And they're like, no, bro. <laughs> it's like, not a chance. <laughs> we can still get reports from her. Things aren't going great for Boeing right now. I accept a reasonable amount of danger as an astronaut. I will not do that. I will not do that. So after almost three months, the decision finally came down. They've already... Oh, wait, hold on. Hold on. It took them three hold. months to decide? Wait, 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 wait. I'm, I'm blowing... They're blowing past some critical details. They said in the previous paragraph that the test flight uh, for the pair would have been a week-long test. Mm -hmm. And now they're saying in the next uh, paragraph that after almost three months of deliberation. So it was a week-long thing two and three-quarter months ago. Yeah. <laughs> now it's... Well, I mean, look, if, if they're going <laughs> to if they're going to reenter in the Earth's atmosphere, like you want to be pretty sure. I mean, this dude, was, you know, these people. All right. So the two people, Butch Wilmore and Suni Williams. Butch Wilmore. Great astronaut name. Yeah. Butch Wilmore is a great. That's a first class astronaut yeah. name. No question about that. And Suni Williams will come back on SpaceX capsule on Friday. Uh, no, in February. Um, but like they were canceling dinner plans in June. Yeah. Right. Th this is unbelievable. And now the government saw fit to 
release it to the Associated Press to put a shine on it for them? They were they were like, listen, so it's Brat Summer, guys. <laughs> Kamala's on the road. <laughs> We can't talk about it. She can't really make the decision if she wants to bring you. She thinks you should get on to the Boeing capsule. We know it looks a little dangerous, and it's it's, it's probably going to blow up, guys. But we want you to get on that thing. Listen to this line that they used to describe it. It says, their empty Starliner capsule, Starliner capsule will undock in early September and attempt to return on autopilot with a touchdown in the New Mexico desert. They're like... This thing is safe, (laughs) but we're having it try to land in the most remote part of the planet we can find, dude. You got to keep that sucker away from people. Like, if you get aboard it, at least you'll die and no one will be there to see. (laughs) It was a blow to Boeing, added the Uh, safety concerns, plaguing the company. Somebody please think of Boeing. Yeah, somebody think about them. Somebody... Uh, the company has insisted Starliner was safe based on all the recent thruster tests in both space and ground. Well, definitely not safe enough for NASA, which it's uh, the head of the Space Council, Kamala Harris, uh, presides. Hmm. I mean, come on, dude. It's just like, <laughs> it's this hilarious just cacophony of nonsense that like, like, do I think she's doing the math on the apex of the return? No. No. But like, she's in charge of it. But you better believe. Work. You better believe if they came down on time, she would have done a touchdown dance. Oh, oh too. Yeah. Like she was John Kennedy. Like, she, yeah, we're going to the moon next week. You right. know, and the press would have been like, "Yes, she's right. She's, she's a leader. She does space again." That was her idea. <laughs> yeah, she's brought us back. Well, all of this can be solved with some diplomacy, fellas. Yeah, hundred percent. And there's a new way to do all of that, according to the Finnish. Mm. Uh, this is from the New York Times paper of record. The old gray lady, they call it. <laughs> All the news that's fit to print. That's right. They uh, have a headline. Whatever happens in the sauna stays in the sauna. Colon. Diplomacy conducted in the nude. So this is the story. It says when you're half naked or sometimes completely naked, it allows for deeper discussion, said Miko Hautala. Hautala? Miko Hautala. Mm-hmm. I'll go with that. Ricola? Yeah, the, the, yeah Ricola. Ricola. Well, that, Sounds good. Uh, yeah. The ambassador of Finland to the United States... Are you talk in a way that doesn't happen when you're sitting around a table with a tie or some formal thing. <laughs> Wait, hold on. I got to keep I want, I want, Let me read a little bit before. It. Diplomacy takes shape in different ways. Formal meetings in the Oval Office, state dinners in the East White House's East Grand Room, casual receptions in embassies and one-on-one meetings over martinis and lobbies at five-star hotels. And then there's the way the Finnish government does it, which is in the nude. Mm. So apparently... Here's what's hard for me to figure out. They clearly have a policy here because he says we have a golden rule. Whatever happens in the sauna stays in the sauna. Okay, so like this is incredibly unsafe. Yeah, he's like, get naked and let's talk diplomacy. (laughs) You have the like an ambassador who's got like diplomatic immunity telling you get in the room and and no one finds out. Wait, hold on. Can we put graphic three up? That's the guy. Okay, that's the guy. This dude tells you. I got a good idea. Let's get get naked. Get in the room and take your clothes off. And you don't tell anybody I, what happened here. Listen, listen. <laughs> they, they, no. Fin, Finland, can we put that graphic back up? Because Finland has a migration problem. And I think that if you distribute this report to everywhere in North Africa, they will not have a migration problem. Because every 20-year-old North Africa is going to see that guy and know he's naked in Finland. And they're going to be like, oh, I don't want to go. <laughs> Maybe that's what he's getting at. They're not going. Well, even a small flat. They, they're talking about all how, like this has become a thing. In yeah. Finland. What's unclear to me. All right. So there's a little bit of background. 16 years ago, the Finnish embassy in Washington, D.C. decided to invite influential people, politicians, diplomats, journalists, civil servants and ap- academics to experience the sauna together as a means of networking. Bro, this gets more insidious you guys, by the minute. Dude. If you guys got one of these invites. Hell no. No. Yeah. Thank you. Thankful. I mean, the, I mean I, the, the the secret cabal of swamp people who meet and get naked in the secret finish room and can't talk about it. It is kind of. It wouldn't is, you think at one is, point I would have gotten at least an invite out of that? It, Maybe it, they knew because I talk about it. It might go to spam. N- negotiating in a sauna naked really makes it literal when you say, I, I couldn't do anything. You had me by the balls. <laughs> <laughs> the Diplomatic Sauna Society, as gatherings are now called, Come on. is now a coveted invitation in the Beltway, thanks to Finland's growing influence in international affairs and desire of busy professionals to live healthier lives. Healthier lives? I mean, what about this is healthier? Uh, a lot of people are trying to get a ticket. 
It's very sought after, said Robbie Grammer, 33, who writes about diplomacy and national security for foreign policy. Well, but aren't saunas Magazine. are good for you, though, right? Opens up the pores, you're getting out the sweat, toxins and whatnot. Sure, sure. But, like, right? a lot of things are good for you that you don't need to, like— do in a group naked and demand no one talk about what happened. Dude. Can we like, put graphic three up one you know more what I time? Mean? Can we put one more time? I just got to see oh, it. No. Hey, Robbie, you got any plans for Friday night? <laughs> How about no, no. Sana? That's Miko. That's... No, I know, but that's Miko's giving the message. This oh, is the this guy, is Miko talking. This is the guy that shows up who's, in, who's giving you the invitation. No, you, you, you show up at the Finnish embassy, and it's this guy and Robbie in towels. You're like, come on in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just I just can't sign imagine. Sign this NDA. Can you, imagine, can you imagine just trying to casually play some pickup basketball, and you go into the sauna for 10 minutes, and they're having, like, a long-form discussion about foreign diplomacy? Oh, my God. Horrifying. I'd lock them inside. Yeah, you'd be like, who do I need to bang to get out of here? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the secret. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is this is truly in a time where look, DC at one point used to be very fun, but over the last few years, it's become less fun. Obviously, people have like clamped up, and there's just a bunch of weird people that find their homes in DC for different administrations, and like it just become less fun, shall we say? The idea that in the backdrop of all that, there's a, an outfit here that is running an embassy where they just get people naked and do that's how they do their meetings. That's something. I don't know. I mean, I, I might even applaud it. Like, what a, uh, what an amazing thing. Uh, uh, no, man. For me, absolutely <laughs> not, not, man. Not for me. Not for me. He won't when even they, entertain it. They make it so weird where they're like, we say what happens in the sauna stays in the sauna. Like, he's just taking it too far. Like, you, you don't want to say that, like, anyone who gets invited isn't allowed to talk about it. And also, I'm the bald naked dude in the glasses, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. that doesn't seem cool. And when it's when they describe it, and it's not enough for you to grab a martini or a cocktail at a bar where you're like, nah, dude, I only open up when I'm naked and there's an NDA. <laughs> <laughs> there's an NDA. He's adding that. What the hell with that, dude? He's I'm going to go that. You're deflared in time <laughs> here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I don't know. It, it, it makes you think a little. How, bit. how are you going to top Swedish Chef? You can't top it. <laughs> no, I mean, it just—it's like a. It just—it's—it it seems very bizarre and 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 not like totally. It's not on the up and up, well, dude. At least you know you're not being recorded. <laughs> There's that. Who knows, bro? Do you That's also probably wonder, half the game. Do you also wonder just a little bit? You know, in every men's locker room that you've ever been in, I don't care if it's like a like a country club. Or a Y. Or a Y or whatever. How there's always like three or four old dudes who like throw the the towel around their shoulders oh, yeah. and slow yeah. walk yeah. the yeah. length of the locker room. I assume this happens in women's locker rooms too. I'm not privy to. But there's always a couple mm -hmm. who are like... He's very, always the oldest guy in there. Body positive. Like they don't observe the unwritten rule that like, of course, you're not just going to go Frank and Beans yeah. throughout the course of a deal. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know, when it's the worst is when they throw one foot up on the bench. Oh my God! <laughs> like that. Oh! <laughs> And you get a look at the oh. back, from the back shot. Oh. I'm sorry. It's just I've seen it. I get the long, uh, the long hallway where there's nowhere to go. Nowhere. Like you're just walking past the rows no, of lockers. No, you're just averting your eyes. And you're like, oh, my God. I've got to go like at least 15 steps with this. But it's like, a, it's like counting a, the tiles. It's like a car accident. you got to imagine. <laughs> okay, okay. Now, now, <laughs> now imagine 10 of those dudes, except they're Swedish, and you're in a <laughs> room finish, with them. Finish, finish, Let's not the line. Though. They're from Ikea. <laughs> <laughs> and they made you sign an NDA. The whole and place, the door's now locked. The whole place <laughs> smells like those little mini Meatballs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you got to imagine it's part of it. Oh, anyway. man. All right, we had a new study finds, Jim. A great one. Study a really finds. good one. And this is one I think, Smug, you were on to right away. You know how uh, McDaniel loves the study finds, and so he found one. Um, study finds the average person knows if their day has been ruined by 8.36 a.m. That is a strikingly specific time. <laughs> the survey conducted by Talker Research for Avocado Green Mattress, I mean, I don't know how about that, it reveals that uh, the average American can tell by 8.36 a.m. if they're headed for a bad day. Mm -hmm. The poll of 2,000 people found the average person experiences four bad days 
a month. Um, <laughs> wait, wait. The average person experiences only four bad days a month? That's what they That's say. That's what they say? 40, oh, well, 48 for days. for zero, dude. 48 days a year. But they say that they, they know it by 836. Is that check? I think four bad days a month sounds like a low number. Really? Sounds high, dude. I try not to be up at 836 to make that kind of a decision. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the right play. If you if the alarm's already hit you, okay, that's going to be a tough one. But yeah. it's like <laughs> it's, if there's an alarm involved, it's yeah. already a bad day. Yeah. <laughs> First month, <laughs> already getting hassled, dude. <laughs> if the alarm is involved, I mean, they say. Uh, one of the most surprising findings, 26 percent of respondents, uh, a single morning mishap can make their entire day feel like a loss. That's pretty rough. You got to wonder about that. Mornings seem to be the crucial battleground for determining the day's mood. Uh, the top five morning mishaps that signal a bad day include waking up feeling sick, hmm. weak, uh, sleeping poorly during the night. I mean, just like you have kids or not. Uh, wa waking up uh, with a headache. I, I would put that in the sick category. Misplacing your keys. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Forgetting a phone at home. Uh, also, it could make it for a bad day. Mm. But it seems all pretty relative, right? Like you wake up with a stranger in your bed. That could be a rough <laughs> like, setting. I don't remember visiting the Swedish embassy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm throwing this on it's, Sweden. It's Finnish. They can't do anything about it's it. It's the Finns. Why am I sweating and wearing a towel? And <laughs> hey, why is this guy with a towel around his neck doing the slow walk, doing a full catwalk to me? Through I, the... I can't understand a word he's saying. It's all consonants. <laughs> <laughs> Not a single vowel. Well, the uh, impact of these morning setbacks can be significant, according to the study. Nearly half of respondents, 48%, admitted to canceling plans or calling in sick or going back to sleep after sensing that they'd have a tough day. Come what a on. week. Canceling. So you, can't, you, can't, you can't do that. It just seems get ahead. Weak, right? You can't do it. I know our listeners are stronger than that. Mm -hmm. I mean, plus, you're going to have a little adversity. You know, every morning you got one of those emails. Yeah. You're looking at one of them, you're like, ah, Jesus. Maybe it's just our line of work, but there's never once been a day as a Republican in Washington, D.C., in politics that you wake up and you're like, zippity doo da, zippity <laughs> no. I mean, you easily, I mean, never. No, e easily 70% of every morning you're like, this is going to be a tough day. Yeah. But you just have to do the job. Yeah, Gotta I, do I, it. I think that's a great point. I think that's the baseline is like, if you're used to dealing with a lot of crazy shit, it's like, for me, I think that makes it so that, I mean, it takes a lot to get under my skin at right. this point has to people people like their whole frame of mind when it comes to stress and stuff i think in our culture today is is stupid yeah and soft <laughs> yeah that like stress is a good thing for you yeah it's it's if in it's our manifested nature. professionally it absolutely is correct correct this is just people who don't have their life together i'm sorry <laughs> but like if you're if you're losing your keys m multiple times a month and <laughs> you have a bad day because of that, you've got some structural issues with your morning that you have to get figured out. Just leave your keys in the same leave spot Leave in the every same night. spot. Put them, put them in your briefcase. You know, like, I, I don't know. Like, figure it out. Why are you talking to a pollster about how you, you know, oh, I have so many bad days. I just call and sick and I don't go to work. Like, Although the on. one I thought uh, would deeply resonate with uh, with Smug was, I have a headache. Oh, I've got a headache. I'm not going to work. I got three headaches and they're at the <laughs> table with me. Touche, by the way. Touche. That's good. I like that. So with all of that, you remember our question of the week is, do you think that undecided voters or people who just don't pay a lot of attention are going to buy any of this Kamala Harris rebrand? Do they think that she can just undo everything that she's said and done and create an entirely fictional uh, character that the media is trying to create for her? Or do you think she's going to be held accountable? That's our question. Answer, please, on this one, because I really want to know localities and what you guys yeah, think. Ask, I think ask it around. Everybody has people like this in their family. You know, may, they might ask you about politics in October, but they're not paying attention right now. Yeah. Take That's a, a good little, idea. Little Shoot gut, a text. little gut check on those people. I'm curious. No question about it. Uh, Smugglesworth, I think we did it. I think so. Absolute banger of an episode. Gentlemen, 
Thank you so much to the minions for tuning in. Remember, if you have not yet, go to the YouTube, hit that subscribe and like. It's more fun in video. So until next time, minions, keep the faith, hold the line, and own the libs. We'll see you on Thursday. Stay ruthless.